important thing that we're uh, going to do here isn't uh, to put on our futurist hat, as it were, and to say, this will never be important. This is never going to be uh, an important macro narrative and a macro narrative that markets care about. It will never be the case uh, that uh, that reopening in China is an important uh, source of macro support. That is not what we want to say here, because frankly, we don't know that. What we can say is we can observe markets, we can observe what they're doing, we can observe some um, some narratives uh, around the data that we can see, and from that draw conclusions as to what is going on now, and extrapolate what might be uh, a way to think about what would happen next and how markets would consider it. And so with that in mind, let's look through some activity indicators and see if the pickup in economic activity around the relaxing of COVID rules in China is actually occurring, what impact it might already be having on markets, if any, and what that could mean for asset valuations where they stand. And to the extent that where they stand assumes or doesn't assume a positive outcome to all of this, um, all of this going Beijing's way. So hopefully what we end up with here after uh, we're done is an actionable set of uh, observable variables that we can look at and say, this is real or it isn't, it's happening now or it isn't, it matters to markets or it doesn't. So uh, let's begin here with uh, one of my uh, favorite indicators uh, in this story so far, which is volumes on the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect. Now, what this is, is uh, essentially a way for investors that have access to markets in Hong Kong to buy shares directly in Shanghai and for people with access to markets in Shanghai to buy shares directly in Hong Kong. This is important because this is an outlet for mainland investors to have exposure to markets outside of China. It is a way for investors outside of China to have exposure to mainland markets. If there were to be an opening that encouraged economic activity, you might expect to see more volume on this uh, on this conduit. You would expect to see a pickup in economic activity uh, give you, on one hand, mainland investors that have uh, had pent-up capital stuck uh, inside of China th through lockdowns start to deploy it. And so you might expect to see a pickup in what are called southbound flows from mainland out to Hong Kong. At the same time, you might expect uh, global investors via Hong Kong to start to look for ways to gain exposure to a positive China reopening narrative, what are called northbound flows. As it happens, if you look at the situation now, what you see is a pickup in activity going into December. You can see that that's that spike around November, December. And then when the reopening occurs, a prompt collapse in those volumes. So uh, needless to say, uh, China is, a, uh, is command economy adjacent, let's say. I wouldn't go so far as to call it... Uh, a command economy in the Soviet Union sense, um, but it is certainly central planning heavy. What that means is that there is more of a central node to, inf to information around economic policy, so things are not as dispersed in terms of economic decision-making as they might be elsewhere, so leaks of information are more likely. It is absolutely within the realm of possibility that um, somebody knew that this relaxing of COVID 
rules was going to happen in December. And so there was a pickup in activity leading into it in November uh, because uh, clearly uh, somebody was in a position to say something to someone um, as to whether they did or not, of course, who knows. But just looking at the price action, it does seem like there was a pickup in activity leading into the reopening and then a buy the rumor, sell the fact response. Very quickly, things fell. And so if we look at where the average is, we are below it, not too far, but in and around the average and on the lower side of it at the moment. Now, the look back for this average is all of last year, which, of course, is a period of persistent lockdowns. So we are no better off. We're not necessarily worse off, but we're no better off on volumes along this um, incredibly important financial conduit uh, than we were through the entire zero COVID stretch last year. So with that in mind, no reopening signs here, it would seem. No signs of imminent collapse either, but no indication that the reopening story has put it, its money where its proverbial mouth is. Now, let's look at something that's more of uh, an indicator of on-the-ground economic activity. And uh, hat tip to uh, Jim Bianco here. He, this is something that, that he's been talking about uh, and um, a variable that, uh, that he's uh, introduced into my uh, quiver. I didn't realize that Weibo uh, has uh, made available uh, China Metro daily passenger volume numbers that are uh, reasonably reliable and readily accessible. Uh, so uh, definitely uh, a big shout out there. Uh, take a look at what we see. What I've done is I've taken an average of the five largest cities in China, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, um, Chengdu, uh, uh, and uh, what I've looked at here is the uh, situation as it looks uh, in those places on average. So I've taken an average of um, the largest five, uh, and I've tracked it over time. I then took the average of that average over the past year, and that's the, um, the orange line that you see down the middle of the the chart and so what you're seeing there then is uh essentially a pickup certainly but a pickup that really brings us within a hair of the average but nothing like an explosion in economic activity uh, nothing like a wave of people coming back to work that is discernibly different from what we saw, again, through the entire lockdown in the previous 12 months. So certainly the case that there is a pickup in uh, metro passenger volume, without question. But is this the kind of explosive pickup that we might uh, expect from the world's second largest economy coming back online? It doesn't seem to be. It seems like we are approaching the average, uh, but we're not really uh, diverting from that average. We're not really showing anything tremendously eye-catching. Uh, we're looking, it would seem, at um, a situation that's about baseline for the lockdown period. By the way, that fifth city I just uh, forgot to mention is Guangzhou. So this is an average of Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Chengdu. So looking at this, again, it would seem the foot traffic isn't there to suggest that there is a mass return. And, of course, that would be anecdotally reasonable. There is a tremendously difficult COVID situation in China at the moment— Admittedly, it is mostly hurting the elderly, 
and people with comorbidities. Um, one might, I think, reasonably surmise that most young people, middle-aged people, certainly the bulk of the uh, working sort of labor force supply has probably already had COVID um, and uh, maybe sort of dealing with either a second case or a third case as we get these new uh, variants that are popping up, Omicron still uh, the most dominant, it would seem, though again, the data has become more murky as part of uh, China's reopening, they've stopped reporting on cases which makes this uh, a much more difficult, much more murky exercise. But looking at this, I think what we find out is there is certainly enough hesitation, certainly enough absenteeism from offices, certainly enough of uh, a holding back of the masses convening in public spaces to suggest that there isn't a runaway reopening burst of economic dynamism that we're looking at. Naturally, one might say, but wait, wait a minute. Don't we have a pickup all around in commodities linked to Chinese demand? Isn't that what we are looking at here. Well, let's see. That would certainly be uh, one element of a supportive narrative. Were it to be the case, let's see if, if in fact it is. And you can see here, we have indeed had a pickup in commodities where China is uh, a commanding buyer in the market. That would suggest a level of anticipation of a pickup in Chinese demand. Now, what I've done here, because, of course, the prices of all of these things are incredibly disparate and getting them all on a two-dimensional chart in a meaningful way can be challenging, uh, is I've indexed them all to 100, where 100 is the starting uh, uh, point at the beginning of last year, and we're uh, looking at them through to now. And that's essentially a way to just compare apples to apples, as it were. What you see here for copper, let's say, is a bottom at mid-year, long before there's a conversation about Chinese reopening, and a subsequent move that hasn't gone very far. What you see for zinc is a bottoming around October, going into November. For iron ore, similarly, a little bit later, but similar uh, to zinc, well before December. So it is certainly the case that these commodities have rebounded. I would say it is not so much the case that they have explosively rocketed to levels preceding Chinese lockdowns. All of them are still inside the range that existed uh, for Chinese demand for these things within the lockdown uh, period. So while all of them ostensibly appear to have bottomed, none of them have really shown anticipation of a wave of Chinese demand coming in. And a lot of the bottoming occurred before the reopening was a narrative on anybody's mind. Rather, a lot of these bottoms uh, occurred when we were still very much looking at commitment to zero COVID as a policy, very much looking at a more, um, a more adversarial stance from Beijing um, than we've subsequently uh, seen. Iron ore has been uh, a particular focus uh, there because, of course, that uh, tends to mirror, to some extent, the relationship between uh, China and Australia, one of its major suppliers, uh, which has been somewhat um, fractious recently and seems to be at least trying to get back on better footing. But with all of that encompassed here, a... December, that is a game changer kind of story, does not appear. 
Okay. Weirdness in commodity markets, you might say. Russia-Ukraine war muddying things, you might say. A lot of these things um, Russia is a big supplier of. Nickel is not on this chart. That's up there. Aluminum, uh, not as big of an import, but certainly uh, notable. Uh, zinc, all of these things um, are perhaps Russia-sensitive. So maybe this is just a weird market. Let's look at stocks. Surely that can make more sense um, of what's going on. And it can, but not perhaps in the direction you would think if China reopening as a positive narrative for uh, Chinese equities is a story that you like. So consider what we're looking at. You have certainly had a spirited rebound in ASHR, the ETF uh, tracking uh, China's CSI 300 A shares. A shares are uh, the more liquid, fancier uh, ones to the higher beta H shares, which are a little bit more uh, jumpy. So A shares, uh, if, if you want to think about Chinese stocks, are uh, the uh, the fancier uh, cream of the crop version um, of the two options. And CSI 300 is a composite of um, Shenzhen and Shanghai bourses. So it's a very kind of S&P 500 type look at, uh, at, at Chinese shares, a kind of catch-all. So uh, ASHR is uh, a good reflection of the overall state of the market. Uh, FXI, of course, uh, the very liquid iShares large cap uh, index of Chinese shares, uh, another ETF. And not surprisingly, one can see where one gets the positive narrative at first blush. There's been a very spirited rebound here, a very aggressive decline and then a very spirited r rebound. But take a look at where it occurs a month before there is conversation about China reopening. And again, maybe somebody leaked. Maybe somebody leaked uh, to people with significant capital to make a difference. But the explanation that is simplest oftentimes is most correct. So when you see this kind of thing and you line up against it, the top in Fed policy expectations for 2023, the top in Fed policy expectations for 2024, what you find is the identical turning point in early November. You find that just as you get this rebound in Chinese stocks, so too you get the expectations for rate hikes in 2023 anchored. The expectations for rate cuts in 2024 building. So what this is then is a generalized tailwind for risk sentiment. If you are saying to markets the cost of financing investment has peaked in the market's perception and might even be going down as of next year, what you're saying is it is perhaps now more attractive to be going out there to buy risky assets. That doesn't mean those risky assets are a good buy or will be uh, a winning investment. No. What it means is the markets are less scared that a weird, aggressive turn toward a more hawkish setting in U.S. monetary policy is now less likely. Is this sort of like picking up pennies in front of a steamroller? Maybe. But it's certainly not um, outside the realm of market normative behavior to pick up said pennies in front of said steamroller. So it looks very much like in the absence of clear evidence that there is economic rebounding actually occurring, what this is more about is stability in the cost of capital and a reallocation to risk assets more broadly. This is ostensibly why you could have this uh, occurring at the very same time 
that you get a pivot in Fed policy, at the very same time that you also get a rise in risk assets not in China, be it the S&P 500, be it share indices not in the U.S. or China, but globally, be it commodities uh, and other things. Uh, in, indeed, the anticipatory jump along the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect actually lines up with these bottoms in Chinese shares and also with these tops in the Fed policy outlook. So it is perhaps the Fed much more so than any kind of reopening from China that is the catalyst here. Indeed, if we look at just a very simple look at baseline GDP expectations, you can see that a survey of economists and uh, market watchers compiled by Bloomberg is telling us that expectations for Chinese economic growth for 2023 have not really improved in December and continue to be near the lows that they hit on their way into the end of last year. There's been a little bit of a recovery in 2024 expectations, but they are not giving us much more of a positive story than they did at the start of the year. We were expecting 5% growth in China in 2024. We dipped a bit to 4.8. We're back at 5. Not exactly the most exciting thing in the world, certainly not the kind of thing that would suggest that we are in the same uh, environment as would be consistent with the explosive reopening of the world's second largest economy. If we thought China was going to grow at 5% in 2024 at the start of last year, and we think the same thing now, where is that optimism exactly? Because it doesn't appear to be showing up in baseline growth expectations. The headlines we see in financial news media and the forecasts actually being written down by market economists certainly don't seem to line up. But wait, there's more. Because we apparently are looking at a situation where growth expectations in China are actually sliding or at least have slid and not recovered, we've also seen a dovish shift in the implied monetary policy curve. Because presumably, the economic weakness now on the menu will require support. So. What I've looked at here is the difference in the yield curves between the start of November, which is exactly where you get the beginning of this rise in Chinese-related stocks. So we'll say if the reopening hopium had some sort of real, tangible substance behind it, it would be from the start of November where that would be a catalyst for shares to go higher. Okay, great. So. What have rate expectations done since the beginning of November? Well, the curve has gotten flatter, and the outlook, at least over the near term, has gotten more dovish. That is not exactly a story of uh, runaway growth and success. It is a story of a need for stimulus for a beaten-down economy. So as we look at growth expectations, as we look at what the markets are pricing in for uh, monetary policy in China. We really don't have this positive story that uh, the headlines in financial news media seems to seem to love so dear. It just does not seem to show up. That does not mean it won't. That does not mean that after we get a peak in cases, wherever that might be, that there won't be an upswell. But it sure doesn't seem to be showing up yet. It's also worth noting that we are entering next week into the Chinese New Year holiday season, which tends to be a time of a lot of travel, typically from the cities back home to the countryside. The countryside is where vulnerable old people tend to still be, and where urban professionals tend to go back uh, to visit for the holidays. Those urban professionals are where the concentrations of people are, that's where the COVID mutation and spread is occurring. Could it be that that the uh, 
various warnings that, that, that public officials have given uh, about staying home, not going on the annual uh, pilgrimage internally here uh, is uh, going to be heated, of course. Of course. And we see a level of um, of reluctance, even in those metro numbers, staying relatively downbeat, that the audience domestically seems to be uh, very receptive to, to a story of, this is a big issue, stay home, don't make Chinese New Year into a massive nationwide super spreader event. But we are also getting a narrative uh, at the same time from Beijing saying COVID is not a big deal. It's basically the flu. Go about your business. And that's the whole reopening of the economy. So there will no doubt be some sort of a middle path between those conflicting pieces of guidance, which makes what we're about to experience next week Maybe not the super spreader event that it could be, but certainly some kind of danger that we get a peak in cases that is higher than the peak that we've seen so far, whatever that peak is, because again, we've not seen the numbers, which China has stopped reporting. What we do have is uh, anecdotal evidence uh, that's been reported from a whole variety uh, of um, reputable outlets, uh, most recently um, the Economist had uh, a whole uh, series in its prior weekly issue, not this week's issue, the one before, uh, that talks about uh, the consequences uh, here and talks about the tremendous difficulty that Chinese systems are having dealing with the surge in cases, shortage of hospital beds, uh, lack of access to quality vaccines, lack of access to quality antivirals, the tremendous surge in the cost of things like Pax, uh, Paxlovid uh, in, um, in China. And so you, you get into a situation then that seems to be at the very least delayed when you're talking about uh, any kind of uh, burst in economic uh, activity. What does that mean from a trading perspective, you might ask. Well, uh, there, I am tempted to look at the Australian dollar, uh, 6A futures in particular. Here, what you're looking at is an asset that's very much anchored, very exposed to Chinese um, business cycle narratives, because Australia is, first of all, looking to China as its number one export market. Secondly, because it is a commodity exporting, uh, cyclically sensitive economy, uh, and an economy that at the same time is experiencing thawing relations with Beijing, seemingly, but also dealing with the slowdown in global growth, thanks to tightening and also dealing with this China reopening either being or not being a tailwind for demand. So what this encompasses is the U.S. dollar's sensitivity to risk sentiment, because, of course, the future is uh, priced in terms of U.S. dollars when you see 68, uh, 60 there, for example, as uh, the veneer term support level, that's 68, 60 US cents uh, that one Aussie dollar costs. And so you've seen a pullback here as the US dollar has strengthened, and as we've seen some more negativity around the, the uh, business cycle narrative. If we start to lose confidence in the China reopening narrative, at least near term, that could be a real significant weight, especially given the context of a U.S. dollar that might be trying to get up off uh, the mat on risk aversion grounds. So looking at 68.60, if we can crack that, maybe uh, we open the door for a decline into the sort of 65.30, uh, 66.50 zone there. You can see that there's a variety of swing lows down there that have acted as, as support before and might do so again. And of course, uh, the, the former... Um, range top uh, uh, there, f former resistance, likely to be a sticking point again, as it often is at 65.35. Uh, on the top side, 70, 79, 70, 80 seems to be that 
recent peak high, and I think the markets would need to be uh, watching that get taken out to build a more constructive narrative. We can, of course, do that. The um, structure of the, the trend higher from mid-October, by definition, a series of higher highs and higher lows, that remains intact. There is not a reversal here, I would argue, at this point that's actionable. But this is something I am looking at as it approaches that very critical 6860 line in the sand. If we were to clear it on the bottom side, we might have extension lower. And indeed, if confidence in China's re reopening were to build, that's where I would look. If, on the other hand, the peak in cases is sooner, the pickup in Chinese ac economic activity is closer at hand. We will begin to see evidence of it going forward. After all, it's only been about six weeks, seven weeks, si since these restrictions have started to come off in earnest. Maybe I'm just an naysayer, and all of this is premature. Well, then you might see a push through 7079, uh, 7140, the recent swing highs, and then we'd build momentum higher. All of that might still be on the menu here, certainly not uh, made impossible by the fundamentals or the price action. So uh, something to watch very closely here as we get to this critical juncture on this very, very sensitive uh, uh, currency for this narrative. With that, happy thought, hopefully. Um, macro money has uh, run its course for today and for the week. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. We'll be back next week. Plenty of fodder for us to uh, go through on a macro level and through the macro lens. Uh, in the meantime, do check out uh, any uh, and every crazy thing that I put out there via Twitter, uh, at Ilya Spivak. Until we are back with macro money on Monday, that's going to be um, uh, at 2.30 Pacific time, 4.30 Central, 5.30 Eastern on Tasty Live. Have a great weekend, everybody. Godspeed.